Obviously, as you all know, uh, this is a reading group in geometric measure theory, a six-week session. Uh, welcome to everyone here. Uh, I'm Largo, and then uh, we have, you know, people who've been around here a long time, so there's Shanties, uh, Tropy. Uh, we've been running this reading group for about two and a half years, done an array of subjects, and now we're going to, well, we're, hopefully we're going to do geometric measure theory. Um, before we talk about anything, though, uh, if you don't know yet, or if you haven't visited it, so I'm not going to really regurgitate a lot of information that's already on the website today uh, and background and stuff. So when you have the time, just make sure you look at the course website. It will tell you about the book and prerequisites. And the first homework has been uploaded, which uh, I'll have you finish by next Saturday at the same time. But, uh, you know, from this point on, any all, all information, all files are going to be uploaded here. Okay. Uh, and then also, so some of you ask, okay, well, why are you using Element instead of Discord? So I don't know if you guys have set this up yet, but uh, Element allows you to uh, have LaTeX instant messaging. So you can write in LaTeX notation, you can just do dollar signs or what have you, and it will instantly render for everyone else in the server. But you need to set it up first. It's a very simple setup. All you have to do is uh, you, navigate, you just... Uh, create this file called con config.json, you're going to paste some code into that, and then uh, some new settings will show up in Element, and you're just going to enable those, and then you'll be able to see LaTeX, and so that's why we're using Element. Um, there's some issues on Discord with the bot that makes uh, makes it slow when uh, LaTeX is rendering, so you know, if you try to use the bot on Discord, you might be waiting 10 minutes to see your formula. This does it instantly, um, so make sure you set that up when you get the time. Now, uh, just really quickly a basic outline for this course. So this is just a six week, week course. Really it's in general measure theory, uh, Cara Theodori style. Um, however, I'm going to, in these lectures, in these Saturday meetings, I'm going to integrate concepts from geometric measure theory, direct, like explicitly geometric measure theory. And then also talk about some applications. Uh, and th those, are, those applications are really gonna center around minimal surfaces. So in addition to Federer, there's another textbook um, that I'm going to be using on the side to be introducing you, uh, you to some minimal surface techniques. Because that's a, that's a main app application of geometric measure theory. There are others, which we'll talk about. Um, but I want to, you know, prepare you for, for, you know, what most people appear to be, in my opinion, doing with geometric measure theory, which is studying minimal surfaces. This is actually where the, this is actually the, uh, how this subject was born, was studying minimal surfaces. Um, so six weeks, six homework assignments. The first one's going to be due December 17th. You already have that one. Uh, there's six problems on it, plus two additional ones. And so for De Federer, the book that we're using, it doesn't have exercises in it. Okay. But there's a lot of places where he might skip over results, so you're going to be filling in those gaps. Um, they're not meant to crush you, the, these exercises. Right now we're going to start off pretty, pretty basic, just routine verifications. As we move on, things will get more complicated. Um, but the goal here is, so Federer, I want you to be able to understand this book. It's a very good book, and it's very well written. The author made a lot of effort to make this book accessible. Uh, and despite that, people will still criticize this textbook as inaccessible. But uh, he's not, you know, geometric measure theory is a subject that integrates concepts from algebraic topology, measure theory, and differential geometry. And he was able to write this textbook, which is uh, self-contained with regards to all three of those subjects. So in that manner, it's quite accessible. He's only requiring from you, as you know, you uh, you well know, four prerequisites, which is a standard undergraduate education in math. Okay, linear algebra, something like uh, to the extent of how Axler discusses vector spaces. Abstract algebra, uh, a course in group theory and ring theory, is sufficient. At some point, we'll need to know some facts about commutative algebra, but I will, of course, introduce those to you. So you're not supposed to know anything about commutative algebra if you don't. Okay, uh, real analysis, so blue root in. You're going to need to know uh, how to prove something uniformly converges. Those are some very important constructions. So not just the first six chapters of root in, but, uh, you know, mostly the entire book sans the chapter on the vague integration at the end. Okay, so some really a good rigorous two semester course in real analysis. And then uh, point set topology, so Munkris, 
some basic facts, house door spaces, uh, you know, you know, T0, T1, all those. Um, but nothing too fancy with point set topology. But you need to feel comfortable. You're going to need to work with, you know, proving something's compact, pre-compact, you know, all these different constructions. Feel comfortable working with topological definitions. Okay. Now, the pace for this course is one section of Federer a week. It's set at that. And that's going to range from about 10 to 15 pages. The biggest week we will have will be when we cover section 2.5 on linear functionals. That's when you'll do the most reading. Okay, but that's it. And so we plan to get to product measures. So this whole session here, six weeks, is going to be equivalent, like I said, to a course in general measure theory. And then after that, once we finish this, uh, we'll deliberate on how we want to continue in Federer. And uh, so this will be important to have this prerequisite knowledge. Okay, just a, okay, uh, before we start getting into the details, just a quick outline of what we're going to be discussing this week. So this is week one. Uh, today, I'm going to introduce you to GMT, sort of motivate the subject, why you should learn it. I really want to convince you and make you feel like this is worth, I want this to be worth your time and get the most out of it. I know a lot of people here are coming from many diverse backgrounds when it comes to math or uh, any other fields in science, so I want to really make sure everyone gets something out of this. So I'm going to introduce the subject, and then uh, Federer, he's going to make in the first couple sections some very set theoretical arguments, uh, ZFC style. So we're going to meet, need to know transfinite induction, we're going to need to know some things about initial segments, very basic facts, I'm not going to really go into the weeds with it. Um, but you just need to be able to know the definitions because on the homework, on problem six, you're going to be uh, applying some of these concepts. And then the following week, even more so on the next homework. And then we're also going to talk about ordinals and cardinals because that will be important. Uh, what Federer is going to do in this first reading, he's going to talk about UM numbers. And he's going to say it is sufficient, we can just restrict our attention in this entire theory to sets that have uh, uh, cardinalities that are Ulam numbers, and that will be useful in proofs. If we know that the cardinality of a set is an Ulam number, it can make our lives easier. Uh, so we're going to need to know, you know, how to process process that information. Okay. On December fourteenth, uh, on Wednesday, we're going to have a study session. So that's just the idea behind that. People just join, discuss the homework problems, discuss the content, and have a back and forth. You know, I really want you guys to be able to communicate with each other and. Uh, you know, collaborate uh, when it comes to this subject, because it's very difficult, as you may have well heard, it's very technical, and, you know, if you go on Stack Exchange, people will say it's very inaccessible, as is as a subject. The reason that there's not many people, uh, you could say, doing this right now is because the, the principal text was very, which is Federer, it's a very inaccessible text relative to other, other things, okay? Uh, and then next Saturday, we're going to talk about explicit geometric. So every Saturday, we're going to be discussing explicit constructions in geometric measure theory, whether or not that's covered in the weekly reading or not. So next week, we're going to talk about the Hausdorff measure, and you're going to be able to, you'll have the prerequisites to know, what, you know how to use that by then. We're going to talk about densities, important, we're going to be using those all the time. Uh, approximate limits and approximate continuity. And I don't think we'll have a time for anything else, but uh, we'll be talking about those next Saturday. And all of these concepts are going to appear on the homework. Once we start discussing the geometric measure theory concepts, those will appear on the homework. Okay, so those will be, you know, those will be something you'll learn in lecture. Uh, so if you want a reference for what I'm following, I'm going to be following more of a schedule like Frank Morgan's book on geometric measure theory for what I'm going to be talking about in lectures. Okay, um, to be, you know, that way, once we're done with this, if you decide to buck out, you at least know some geometric measure theory. It's not all just measure theory. Okay. All right, so let's talk about geometric measure theory. So uh, in essence, it's a mix of three subjects if we bring them together, so three. And, and geometric measure theory really brings in uh, three uh, a major construction of each of these three subjects. So for measure theory, if you mix radon measures for measure theory together with currents from differential geometry, together with homology theory from algebraic topology, you essentially get geometric measure theory. Okay, It's not necessarily accurate to say that geometric measure theory is what happens when you mix all three of these subjects together. Uh, there's another subject called geometric analysis that uses all three of these subjects quite intensively. Um, but 
really with geometric measure theory, we're mixing these three con constructions together. So radon measures, currents, and homology. And you're not supposed to know anything about any of these. You're gonna, you'll are gonna you learn about them uh, throughout this session. Okay. Now where this starts, so geometric measure theory, uh, its foundations are quite old, all the way back to 1760 by, uh, uh, from a problem proposed by Lagrange, which is, funnily enough, not named after him. And it is, if we have a smooth closed curve gamut in uh, three space, he was wondering, does, do we know that there always exists a surface of least area such that the boundary of that surface is equal to the graph? And what I mean by the graph is, is the trace of that curve in Euclidean space. Does the boundary of that surface uh, equal the graph of, uh, of that curve? So if I were to take, you know, just say for example, so here's our three, some closed curve. Can we fill this in? You know, if we fill this in, we'll get a surface. Does there exist a surface with a boundary that is that curve that is of least area among all the possible surfaces with that boundary? Okay. Can we say that, that always, there always exists a minimal? And you call this a minimal surface. So the problem is that do we always know there exists a minimal surface? Let me see if I can clear the ink here. There we go. Good. Um... And a great way of really, and we'll see some pictures, some really pretty pictures of it in a moment, but a great way of modeling these minimal surfaces are using soap film. So if you've ever, you know, as a kid, you've blown bubbles, and you've dipped this little plastic bit into the bubble fluid or the soap, that, that surface that gets made when that bubble sticks to that, I don't know what you would call that, the, the circle that you dip in the, the bottle for bubbles, that surface is pretty much a minimal surface, uh, and we'll see some pictures that really elaborate on that more. And the idea of really using soap films to look at this problem is something that was done by Joseph Plateau. So instead of naming this problem after Lagrange, it's going to be Plateau's problem. Okay. Um, now as far as the solutions to this, uh, it was first solved, quote unquote, with topological restrictions in 1930, and the author of this book, uh, uh, use the theory of currents to solve it without those topological restrictions uh, for orientable surfaces. And again, if you don't know what orientable is, you're going to learn about it throughout the course of this thing. So here's some uh, examples of minimal surfaces. So the white here is that closed curve. It's that boundary. Okay. So you, So what we're asking is, is there a surface with that boundary that has minimal area across all the possible surfaces with that boundary? Okay, so the first one we have a hyperbolic paraboloid. Okay, so this guy, uh, Seegerman, he's a professor out of Oklahoma State. Uh, he 3D printed all of these boundaries, and then he just dipped them in a bottle of uh, bubble fluid of soap. And then he pulled it out, and then there you go. Those are minimal surfaces. Okay, so, and, and this material, as you, as you know, that's called a soap film. Okay, and you, you know, we have the hyperbolic paraboloid. This is called the catenoid. Okay, so if you have two circles, the minimal surface is, the minimal surface with that boundary is called a catenoid. And then you know what this is, this is a helisoid. Okay, so if I dip a, uh, a helix down in soap, the surface, minimal surface for that is going to be called a helisoid. And this was something else I can't quite remember. Uh, but So these are some examples of minimal surfaces. This is a big object uh, of study in geometric measure theory. And where we need to use geometric measure theory is analyzing Plateau's problems in higher dimensions, okay? So greater than R3. Because the issue is, if we talk, if we restrict our attention to, to surfaces in R3, uh, every solution of this problem is a convenient surface. And what I mean by that, it satisfies, it's called regular, satisfies some very nice smoothness properties, there's no corners, uh, and the tangent plane exists everywhere. Okay, so exactly what you would think of a a smooth or differentiable surface. Okay, no pinches or anything like that. But when we bump things up to higher dimensions, people have found that there are solutions to Plateau's problems in Rn that have singularities. Okay, so points where there are no tangent spaces. And so this picture here would be an example. So this is a, a well, you could just say a surface, and you have one, two, three, four, five, six singularities on it. Okay, so those are points where the tangent space does not exist. Okay, and you can intuitively see why that is. Okay, um, 
And so in order to really study Plateau's problem in Arn, we need a lot, we need substantially more machinery, in fact, okay? Because now, if we have points where we can't talk about the tangent space, we need to see if we can uh, sort of salvage any notion of a tangent space there, okay? And to do that, we need to talk about things like approximate tangent space, et cetera, et cetera, okay? And we're not going to be able to, if we have singularities, we're not going to really be able to have what you would call a smooth manifold, okay? And a smooth manifold here is just, you can think of it as a higher dimensional surface. We'll discuss the definition of that eventually. But you can't have this smooth manifold anymore, okay? So what, do you, what's, what, what can you have? And it will turn out you can have a, what we have, what we call a rectifiable set, okay? And that's motivated by the definition of a rectifiable curve, if you remember that from your analysis class, okay? So a rectifiable set will be a generalization of that. Okay, there's that. There's sets with finite perimeter, which is which are also called these Casio poly sets. Uh, and these, so we're gonna know. Okay, if we have a set, what's the perimeter of it? And that's your usual intuition behind what perimeter means. And that's gonna be really our generalization of a smooth manifold here in geometric measure theory. So that's one theory we need. The other one is the theory of rectifiable currents, which is something developed by uh, Federer and Fleming. Okay, it was originally, uh, I believe, the first publication on it was by Georges de Rome. Okay, but Federer is going to really uh, show us how we apply this idea of currents to uh, study minimal surfaces in higher dimensions. Okay. Now. Other than, if you don't like minimal surfaces, this is still a very useful subject, okay? And it's, it has a, a pretty nice range of applications. So, uh, obligatory partial differential equations. It's very important to know if you study partial differential equations. So, one of the biggest books on PDEs, you know, Evans, you've probably heard of it. Uh, he uses geometric measure theory and uh, proofs like the, uh, what was it? Not the mean value theorem. The maximum principle. So, he uses... Uh, what's called the surface measure, measure which we're going to learn about. Krantz, uh, he is someone who has contributed largely to the, fi to the uh, field of several complex variables and geometric, uh, geometric measure theory. And so his textbook, if you want to read his textbook, you're going to need to know also about the surface measure. Calculus of variations, but that's really just minimal surfaces. Uh, differential and Riemannian geometry. Okay, so what, what we have here with uh, GMT is a way to deal with singularities. And other subjects approach singularities in many different ways. And so geometric measure theory is going to give you one method to deal with them. Uh, but in differential and Riemannian geometry, there's other methods. And there's actually, on this slide, this is uh, Claudio Arezzo. He's over at the ICTP. You may have heard of him. He does lectures on YouTube. Uh, he's talking about singularities here using his own way of looking at them. Okay. Uh, as far as some real-world applications or anything, uh, you know, to do with physics, there's continuum mechanics. There's a paper that was published on it. I just looked up applications of geometric measure theory to physics. So there's one. And then the other one, um, a few of us in this sort of looked over it. Uh, someone published a paper using geometric measure theory to look at soft matter surfaces. Now, I don't know anything about any of those, but just to give you an idea that people have tried to apply them. So... The motivation, though, but behind advertising this and getting people to uh, study geometric measure theory is to get more people interested in it. Perhaps we can, you know, classify minimal surfaces. That's a big open problem. It's coming up with a nice classification theorem for minimal surfaces, just like you have for compact surfaces, for some of you who've had differential geometry. We want to do the same thing with minimal surfaces. So if we get more people studying geometric measure theory, you know, maybe we can come up with something like that. Who knows? But uh, it would be nice to get you know, more people who know about this subject. Okay. Now that uh, I'm going to pause here and just you know ask if there's any questions so far, um, because after this, what I'm going to do, we're just going to spend the rest of the time talking about ZFC, because you're going to need to know that for this first week's reading. So, um, if anyone has any questions, we'll take a break, answer them now, if I can. And I'm going to repeat your question since I'm recording. Has it been flickering, really? Oh, that's not good. Is there a ZFC discussion in the book? No, there's not. So I think that's assumed. 
Um, when he says you need to know point set topology, maybe he's assuming that that was standard. Um, but it's going to be very light, the ZFC that we're going to need to know. Um, and if it is flickering, uh, I'm sorry to hear that. We'll see if we can fix that. But uh, there will be a, I will upload this to YouTube, so you'll be able to see everything. It, it shouldn't flicker then. Yeah, I, I had to, Element was having some trouble doing screen sharing, so maybe there's some more to figure out. speaking you're like super quiet dude oh i don't know how to get this to work you were fine at the end there just talk a little bit louder yeah after you moved the mic we could actually kind of understand what you were saying you said you didn't know how to get it to work testing hello hello Yep, we can hear you. Oh, is that any better? Yep. Yep, correct. So Federer, uh, together with the other guy. Uh, uh, hello? Yep, we can hear hello. you. Hello. Still audible. Yeah, it was uh, Federer and Fleming. Uh, yes. Did the solution of Plateau's problem for orientable surfaces. Yep. The orientable case. And he did that with Fleming. I don't know who Fleming is, but... Where's Federer from? Did anyone look that up? I forgot where he's from. Uh, can anybody hear me now? Yeah, we can hear you. We could before. Herbert Federer was born on July 23, 1920, in Vienna. After emigrating to the U.S. in 1938, he studied mathematics and physics at the University of California, Berkeley. Affiliated to Brown University, Providence, since 1945, he is now Professor Emeritus there. Oh, that's dated, but whatever. Well, okay, so what, so uh, there's a question. So the, are the curves required to be smooth? Because if not, why would it be surprising? Well, I wouldn't say it's surprising. I don't know everything about it, but it just happens to be in the three-dimensional case. All the surfaces that, all the minimal surfaces that satisfy Plateau's problem, they are smooth. They're regular. And uh, so, but it turns out in higher dimensions, we will have, we may have surfaces that are not, and we'll have singularities. So the space that we can consider them as will be most generally we can consider them as rectifiable sets, but we can't put a smooth structure on them. And we also uh, can't put a smooth structure on them with boundary. Um, and we'll, we'll see that. And that'll, that's kind of the main problem is that we're going to lose this nice, con uh, you know, nice construction of having a smooth structure on a topological manifold. Um, and so because we're going to lose this, we need to put some gloves on to be able to deal with what remains. Okay. Are you trying to talk again? Can you hear? Yeah, I can hear. So, so Tropy asks a really good question. So is it going to make sense to consider the dimension, boundary, and surface area? It will, because we, when we talked about a rectifiable set, uh, the proper terminology is n rectifiable set, and what a rectif so okay. Let me just we can actually discuss this. This is a really good question. So, what do I mean by rectifiable set? So it, it turns out so if we have a, a a smooth curve, man, that's not great, is it? 
um, if we have a smooth curve, okay, with time parameter t into three space. For a smooth curve, this is what I'll motivate this definite this idea of a rectifiable set. So it's an easy fact to prove, and you may have done it at some point, to prove that any smooth curve into R3, or I think it's just Rn, admits a Lipschitz reparametrization. Okay, now you should know what a reparametrization is. So if we have gamma t, okay, and it, you know, if we have a parametrized curve, there's this notion of direction. Okay, the way it traces as time moves along. Now we can reparametrize it and put gamma one minus t. So this one minus t here is a reparametrization. Okay, we edited the input parameter. This will be the same curve, but instead of moving this way, we're going to move backwards like this. Okay, so that's a reparametrization, and it's a general. It's a it's a basic fact. It's easy to prove that any smooth curve can be can have a reparametrization, there exists a reparametrization of that, it's a mouthful. And that reparametrization is Lipschitz continuous. We're going to be working so much with Lipschitz continuous functions. And so the idea of a rectifiable set, so we can look at rectifiable curves, okay, uh, or smooth curves as just rectifiable curves, okay, just generally as. Yeah, smooth imply, you know, you're exactly, I'm talking about the per, uh, reparametrization. And you end up with what's called a, uh, oh, that's a good question. I should say 0, 1. I mean, you can define it for R, but we're going to want to have it 0, 1 for, for what I'm about to say. Okay. So the idea of a rectifiable set is, is that we take a Lipschitz continuous function, and a rectifiable set, an n-dimensional rectifiable set, is the image of a bounded subset of n-dimensional Euclidean space under a Lipschitz continuous function. Okay. So that's where this idea of a rectifiable set comes from. And so from that you can salvage this idea of dimension. Okay. By saying, you know, it's the image of the of an end, you know, a subset of n-dimensional Euclidean space that's bounded. Um that answers your question. So, what was I also going to say about that? Yeah, I think. And so, you when you do this reparametrization, it's called you parametrize it by arc length. Okay. And and I'm not talking about when I say Lipschitz, I'm not talking about gamma itself. I'm talking about its parameter being Lipschitz continuous. Okay. And so that's called parametrization with respect to arc length. So the proof is, and you can try it yourself. Every smooth curve admits a Lipschitz reparametrization. And therefore, you can so smooth curves are just one-dimensional rectifiable sets. Okay. So there's some sense. So there's some sense of differentiability, but not. Well, I'm sorry. Well, Lipschitz. We're going to see this, and I don't want to go on too long about this because we need to get going. But a Lipschitz continuous function we're going to see is differentiable almost everywhere. You've probably heard of a result like that, um, but stuff we're going to learn more about. But anyway, I don't want to take up too much time because we have some we have a lot of set theory to cover uh, for the homework. So I'll take any any more questions. I mean, there's a flow to a ship. Yeah, in, in a way, because we can talk about this thing called an approximate tangent space. Oh, let me just say this. So the approximate tangent space, and we're talking about this dimension and everything. If you remember from calculus. You can think of smooth functions. Smooth functions locally behave like the tangent space in that locale. So if I have a point and I consider a small enough neighborhood, it's pretty close to the tangent space. Right? If you remember Euler's approximation, if you did that in high school, okay, you see that a smooth function locally behaves like its tangent space. Okay? So when we talk about the approximate tangent space, there's going to be this really important result that a set is rectifiable if and only if its approximate tangent space exists almost everywhere. Okay, so think about that geometrically. So we're saying we have something that behaves almost everywhere like its tangent space. And we know from calculus that functions that are like that are smooth. Okay, so we're trying to suffice these very conceptual ideas. Okay. So there is this sort of flow to it. Okay, it's not complete. It's not a complete disaster. Okay. 
Okay, and then one more question, and then I promise we'll move on. So the difference between ge uh, geometric measure theory and geometric analysis. So geometric analysis is really focused on using partial differential equations, to my knowledge, to understand uh, the uh, cohomology of smooth manifolds, something like that. But not only that, you'll use, it also shows you how you can employ methods from partial differential equations to get results on in particular Riemannian manifolds. So I'll give you an example for those who know differential geometry and then I'll stop this tangent. If I have a Riemannian manifold and I want to talk about the existence of geodesics, for compact Riemannian manifolds, if I'm not mistaken, you can prove the existence of geodesics using the heat equation. Okay. Now the usual proof for the existence of geodesics does not use the heat equation, but the you know, point of geometric analysis is we can get these results and more by applying techniques from partial differential equations, in particular Sobolev spaces, Sobolev spaces or whatever, and we can get these results. Okay, so geometric analysis, there's this huge emphasis on partial differential equations, and we're not going to have that emphasis here. But this GMT as a whole definitely has applications in partial differential equations as a subject. Okay, so... Um, you know, thanks for the questions, they're really good, but let's go ahead and we'll talk about some uh, set theory. Okay, uh, so you've probably seen this before, so this is a, bi you know, you know what a binary relation is. If we have two sets, X and Y, you know the Cartesian product, you know how to form that. And then a binary relation over the, uh, those two sets is just a subset of that Cartesian product. Now typically X, is gonna, X and Y are going to be the same set. Okay, so we're going to be just talking about a relation over one set. Okay, so if X and Y are in this subset, we, we have this notation here, which you've probably seen before, um, using this sort of X, R, Y. Okay. So, uh, the most important type of relations, the only ones we're going to need to consider are these things called orders. So, we're just going to talk about different types of them. And really, I apologize, but I'm just going to be <laughs> sort of throwing definitions at you just so you have enough to understand what Federer is doing because you don't we don't really need to go too deep into these you just need to get the gist of things so we're gonna let a be a non-empty set and we're gonna consider two binary relations on a uh, and I'm gonna call this one I guess I don't know uh, less than or equal to and then less than, strictly less than okay so the relation less than or equal to we're going to say it's reflexive if for every uh, element in the set, every element in the set relates to itself. Okay, so A is less than or equal to A. Okay. And the way I'm saying, you know, less than or equal to that's suggestive. I mean, if you think about R and then less than or equal to, you know, it's reflexive. Okay, it's transitive. If uh, we have for three elements of A, if A is less than or equal to B and B is less than or equal to C, then that should be, that should be less than or equal to then A is less than or equal to C. Okay, again, things that you've probably, you know, you've seen before. And then uh, the third one's weakly anti-symmetric, so if A is less than or equal to B, and B is less than or equal to A, then A is equal to B. Okay, so these are uh, conditions that a relation can satisfy. Okay? And then a pre-order on A is a relation that is reflexive and transitive, and then a partial order satisfies all three. And you could probably start by thinking of already some examples of partial orders. And we'll discuss some examples so everything's clear. Okay. And then the relation strictly less than, we have two more conditions. It's going to be irreflexive if, for any element, any element does not relate to itself. Okay, so you can understand why it's called irreflexive. And then anti-symmetric, if it's the case that if A is less than B, strictly, then it is not the case that B is less than A. Okay, so if 1 is less than 2, then obviously 2 is not less than 1. Okay, so again, things you've seen before. And then a strict partial order is just going to be an irreflexive, transitive, and anti-symmetric relation. Okay, so we have these two and this one right here. So that's what we'll get for a strict partial order. If we want a just a regular partial order, we just have these three for a partial order. Okay, very basic. Um, an example of it, uh, one that you'll know, if you just consider, 
you know, if you consider, okay, if we have a set x, we're going to use this notation because this is what Federer does. 2 to the x, this is the power set of x. So this is the collection of all subsets of x. And you can consider the relation. Okay, now I'm going to, you know, of course, x is not empty. Otherwise, it's just a trivial example. And then you're going to consider the relation subset. Okay, so you guys know what that means. So if a is subset of b, then every element of a is an element of b. Okay, so this here, this is a relation, and it in fact is a partial order. Okay, is a a subset of itself? Yes. If a is a subset of b, b is a subset of c, then of course a is a subset of c. Okay, if a is a subset of a, of b, and b is a subset of a, I apologize for the bad handwriting, uh, it's, I promise it's better when it's not PowerPoint, then of course you get a is equal to b. Okay, so this is a partial order. And if you do, well, what's the other one? Well, you can do strictly a subset, okay, and get a strict partial order. Okay, so that's just a very trivial example. Okay, now I want to talk about total order, so we're going to build on this idea, and the, uh, the goal here is to get to this thing called well ordering. The idea, again, if you're wondering what the motivation for discussing this is, we want to generalize the, the process of induction that you remember from your undergraduate proofwriting class or analysis class. We want to really generalize that to as much as we can. So we need to first talk about orders and how we can order things. Okay. So a total order, so if we have a partial order, it's going to be total, we also call it a linear order, if it's going to satisfy this property. So for all a, a and b in our set A, Either A is less than or equal to B, or B is less than or equal to A. Okay? So I have a question. So is this going to be, is subset going to be a total order? No, it's not. Because it is not the case that any two sets are comparable like this. Right? Okay? For example, if I consider the set 1 and the set 2, okay, neither one is a subset of each other. So you can't say that the subset is a total order. Okay. But if you go on R, the real line, and you consider you know, the usual order that you're used to, well, that's going to be total. For any two numbers in R, one is going to be less than or equal to the other. Okay. Because that's just what a total order is. And then a strict partial order, maybe I shouldn't have written it, uh, it's just going to be a strict total order. Okay. If the associated uh, is a strict total order, if the associated partial ordering is total. Okay. So it's just... We just move it to strict. Okay. Now we can talk about well orders. So well order, okay, so maybe motivate this. If you remember, uh, you have that property from number theory. Any subset of an in, of the integers have a least element. That's the well ordering principle. Okay, so that's where the name comes from. So a well order is going to be a total order such that every non-empty subset of A has a least element with respect to that total order. Okay, so if I want to put it in symbols, okay, so a, a well order satisfies this property. For all B is a subset of A that's not empty, there exists a X in B, an element of B, such that for all other elements, X is less than B with respect to that order. Okay. Um, yeah, oh, I can, yeah, okay. Sorry about that. That's it. So there's this thing called the well-ordering theorem, okay, which is that every set can be equipped with the well order. This is a big part of ZFC, okay, because uh, this is equivalent to the axiom of choice. So in this book, we're using form ZFC, obviously, um, but this is a, an important concept that every set can be equipped with a well order. So that includes the real line, okay. But you know, be careful here because what we mean by a well order is not going to be something that. It, you know, makes the resultant set, like if it's a field, if we're in R, the real line, that is not to say every field can be made into an ordered field, okay? Because C can't, the complex plane, if you took complex analysis, you remember you can't uh, order C so that it respects multiplication and uh, uh, addition of complex numbers, okay? But every set can be equipped with a well order, including the real line. Okay, so from here on, we can just take any set and talk about 
a well order on that set. Even if we can't write it down explicitly, we can still talk about it. Okay, and that's going to be really important. Okay, is that okay with everyone? This idea we can. Okay, this is really important because otherwise, you know, this is how we're going to be able to justify things like doing induction and so on. Okay, all right. All right, so let's talk about initial segments. So on the homework, uh, exercise 6B, if I recall correctly, you're going to prove that something is an initial segment in the set of all ULAM numbers, I think. Or no, the set of all ULAM numbers, something like that. You're going to need to prove something's an initial segment. It's a very basic definition. So if we have a set A with a well order, uh, then a subset I, so, you know, a subset of A, we call it an initial segment if for all elements of that subset and for all elements of A, if we have that A is less than I, then A is in I. So if you, you know, if you want to think about it like this, if we have A here in blue, it's sort of a strip because you can think of it as an order. So the bigger elements are up here, bigger elements with respect to the total order, I mean the well order, uh, less than. So an initial segment is going to look like this. So if we have I here, then I is going to go all the way down here. And that's going to continue. So that's sort of the picture, okay? Because if we have A, so if I have, I, you know, if this right here, this is the element I, if we have an element of A that is less than that, then it's going to be in the set I. So that's what an, an initial segment is. That's kind of the picture you can think of in your head. Okay. And then a proper initial segment is just an initial segment that's not equal to the entire space. Okay. So if let's okay, let's do a concrete example of an an initial segment. Okay, so if we're working in the naturals, okay, and I consider so if we're in n, and in this case n does not contain zero. I think that's the convention Federer uses. Okay, so an initial segment, an example, you know, we just equip this with the natural ordering, and the natural well order. Okay, an initial segment would be just okay numbers up to n. That's it. Okay, so you know I could say I is the set n in n, set, well, say i sub capital N, such that n is less than capital N. That's an initial segment, okay? As you can see, because if I have, you know, any element of this set is going to be less than n. If I have something less than that element, then it's also going to be an n, okay? That's just what an initial segment is. So you're going to prove something's an initial segment. It's a very straightforward Applica application of the definition. You never need to do anything fancy. Okay. Okay. And given this, we have enough tools to actually be able to perform mathematical induction with respect to a well order. Okay. So this is like the principle of mathematical induction theorem for well ordering. So if we have a set A with a strict well order, less than, and then psi of x is going to be a property defined on A. If, if it is the case that for all elements of A, we have that if B, for all B less than A, if B, B holds, then that implies that A holds, okay? So for all B less than A, the satisfaction of B, B satisfying the property psi implies that A satisfies the property. So psi of B holds implies psi of A holds, okay? If that is the case, then psi holds on the entire set. Okay, so as you can see, this is a generalization of the principle of mathematical induction. If for all points, one applies the next, then it's going to hold for the entire set. Okay, essentially. Now, the proof of this is rather straightforward, um, and we can go through it. Let me see what time. So it's 3.18. Uh, we can go through the proof of it. It's actually very straightforward, or I can just tell you, and I think I'm just going to do that. Um, let me just make sure I do this. So what you're going to do is, I'll just actually, I'm not going to write it down, but I'll, if you want to see the proof of it, we can certainly talk about it. But all you're going to do is you're going to consider the set where you're going to assume for contradiction that the conclusion doesn't hold. So it's a proof by contradiction. It's like a, a six line proof. You're going to consider the set where uh, the property fails. You're going to take a, the smallest element of that set and you can do that particularly because of the uh, that well order result, okay, from earlier. And then you're gonna do some definition. Okay, we don't have uh, we don't have too much time to go through it. So, but it's a rather straightforward proof. 
Um, another thing that might be helpful to know is this thing called the regularity axiom. axiom. So uh, one thing, a little notation switch, the so lowercase letters may represent a set. Okay, so if I say y is an element of x, you know that x here is implied to be a set. Okay, so this is to say that for all non-empty sets, there exists an element of that set disjoint from it. This is what's called the regularity axiom. Axiom is one of the principal ones of uh, ZFC, very important. Okay, so every non-empty set contains an element disjoint from it. Okay, now to wrap things up, we're going to talk about ordinals. We're almost done. So a set A is called an ordinal if first it's transitive. So for every element in alpha, not A, for every, el for every element in alpha, that element is a subset of alpha. So that's what we mean by it. So that's what's called a transitive set. Okay, so an ordinal set that satisfies that property in the second. The second property is kind of intuitive. So uh, the second property is for any two elements of alpha, we have either have three things. Either beta is equal to gamma, beta is included in gamma, or gamma, oh, I'm sorry, beta is an element of gamma, or gamma is an element of beta. So they're comparable with respect to, uh, you know, they're, they're sort of comparable in this sense. Okay, and so that's what we call an ordinal. And we have this nice property to, to really think about ordinals. So an ordinal, uh, it, so any set is an ordinal if and only if it's transitive, and the set alpha equipped with this relation is an element of, because you can think of that as a relation. If that constitutes a well ordering, then we have an ordinal. Okay. So that's a sort of a, a way to think about the membership relation. Yeah. Is an element of, I like to call it membership relation, but so that's what an ordinal is. And to prove that, you use the regularity axiom. That's a little bit more complicated, so we're not going to talk about it. Uh, some properties of ordinals, maybe we can discuss them, or maybe we should skip them because we're running short on time. There's some nice properties of ordinals. What I think I will do, if you guys want, I will have, uh, I can type up a small descriptive set theory cheat sheet that you can refer to as you read Federer. These are just some trivial properties, you don't really need to know them, um, but I can just, I can actually just read them out to you here. So, uh, so the empty set, you can check that that's an ordinal, that makes a really good exercise. Um, any element of an ordinal is itself an ordinal. Okay, again, those follow directly from the definition. Okay, um, if we have an initial segment of any ordinal, then either that initial segment is an element of alpha, or that initial segment is equal to alpha. Okay, that would be nice. Okay, well, so I will, it will be on the website. I will type up a very nice cheat sheet for descriptive set theory with lots of results, okay? And I can maybe do some proof sketches for you, okay? The fourth one, if we have two ordinals, and so alpha and beta are two ordinals, and beta is not a subset of alpha, then it is necessarily the case that beta is an element of alpha, okay? If alpha and beta are ordinals, then either one is a subset of the other, okay, which is really nice. So they're so any two ordinals are comparable with respect to the subset relation. Uh, yeah, and there's some supremum ones, but okay, I think that's fine. So I will publish a cheat sheet so you all can feel comfortable with these things, and, and on that cheat sheet I'll put some exercises. How's that? Okay, but they won't be part of the main homework. Okay. All right. Um, Okay, so we're going to define an order on ordinals. So we're just going to, it's just going to be some notation. So if alpha is an element of beta for two ordinals, we're just going to write alpha is less than beta with respect to this. Okay. Uh, but an important case of ordinals are going to come from natural numbers. So natural numbers, they're finite ordinals, and we can define them recursively. Okay, so our base case zero is the empty set. And then n plus one, to get the next one, we take that number n, and we union it with the set containing n. Okay, so 1 would be what? Okay, so 1 is 0 plus 1, so that's going to be 0 union with the set containing 0. Okay, so we can look at natural numbers in this way, where every natural number is a, is a set. Okay, 
You really look at it that way. So empty set. Yeah. Uh, so the first infinite ordinal is called omega zero, and that is the set of whole numbers, not natural numbers. Okay. So so whole numbers. You know, I was the book I was referencing kind of goes back between the two, but omega zero is going to be the whole numbers. So zero, one, two, etc. And that's called the first infinite ordinal. The first uncountable ordinal is omega one. Okay, and you're gonna, if you know, you're gonna see what these are in a second. It's gonna be clear. And then the first uncountable ordin ordinal, which is not equinumerous. And by first, you're looking at this again, this relation we defined by being an element of. Okay, right? Alpha is less than beta. We have this notion of ordering on the ordinals. Okay, so the first uncountable ordinal, which is not equinumerous. Okay, so the least one that is not equinumerous with omega one is called omega two. And what do I mean by equinumerous? Okay, well, equi two sets are equinumerous if there's a bijection between the two, right? That's what I mean by equinumerous here. Okay, and in terms of cardinality, again, this will make it clear to you, we call these sets aleph naught, aleph one, and aleph two, respectively. Okay, so aleph naught, okay, that's just, you know, something's countable, a set's countable. Aleph one, cardinality of the continuum, right there. I think that's called Beth. Um, and then we have aleph two, okay? So just some, uh, and so what you're going to prove is that aleph naught here is an ULAM number on the homework. And you're going to prove uh, uh, we have something with initial segments I can't quite remember. Okay. Just an important uh, example. So ordin so we can do arithmetic with ordinals. We can talk about the successor ordinal. ordinal. So the successor ordinal beta of an ordinal alpha, so you can think of that as like, you know, 2 is the successor of 1 on the real line, I mean on the, and the naturals, etc. So beta well, how we define naturals, right? This is going to lend just generalizing it to this idea of successor. So beta is equal to alpha plus one, which is notation for alpha union with the set containing alpha. So for any ordinal alpha, that set alpha union, the set containing alpha, that's the successor to alpha. Okay. And then uh, an ordinal is called a limit ordinal if it's not equal to zero, okay, so I not empty, and then beta is not a successor. So there is not, there does not exist any ordinal alpha such that beta is the successor of alpha. I don't believe you're going to need to know this, okay? You're not going to really need to be able, you know, if this is all confusing, you just need to be able to understand when he's, he's going to talk about induction in the second section with respect to a well order, and you need to feel comfortable with what, what's going on there. That's all, okay? Example, we don't have time for one. So let's do transfinite induction. This is sort of the crux of things, and I believe this will be uh, the end of it. So we're going to say, we're going to let psi be a property defined on all of the ordinals. If it is the case we have that for every ordinal alpha, that psi of beta holds or is true for all beta less than alpha, and that implies that psi alpha is true, if that holds, then psi holds for all ordinals. So this is the principle of transfinite induction. It is just, it is actually what we discussed earlier with uh, induction with respect to well order. But it, this time, we just swap out our set A for what? What are we swapping our set out A for? The set of all ordinals. Okay. You do this with ordinals, you get transfinite induction. That's what we call it. This is, an, so transfinite induction, transfinite induction is induction on a well order where your set is just going to be a, of all ordinals, okay? okay? And how do you do transfinite induction? So I think when we get to the Vesidovich covering theorem, so that's proved with transfinite induction, I'm going to have you, probably in homework, do the transfinite induction yourself. And I'm going to walk you through that so you get some uh, practice with it. So to induct transfinitely, so in order to prove a property psi on all ordinals, the base case is, or I should say, uh, yeah, ordinals are not a set. We're just talking about all ordinals. Good point. So the base case, just as you do with regular induction, you're going to prove that psi holds for zero. Okay? And then, then you're going to prove that for any successor ordinal alpha plus one, if alpha holds, then so does its successor. And then finally, you're going to do the limit case. You're going to prove that for any limit ordinal beta, that psi of beta follows from psi alpha, psi of alpha holding for all alpha less than beta. Okay. You prove these three properties, 
uh, you then apply the principle of transfinite induction, we'll call it, and you'll get you'll get the result on all, all ordinals. So we need this for something like the cover, uh, the Basilevich covering theorem, and you can you know, because what's going to happen is we're going to have this set could be really big, and we need to talk about okay, well, can we get this covering on it? Does there exist this covering? We're going to need you know, it's kind of like compactness. Every closed and bounded set, okay, for every open cover there exists a finite subcover. You know. So in that sense, we're going to, you know, we're, we're talking about the existence of a finite subcover. Now we're saying we just needed the existence of a cover that satisfies these really nice uh, relation. And I believe for the Basidovich, it's the overlaps have finite measure between the elements of the cover. Okay. So throughout GMT, we're going to consider different sorts of covering. And uh, uh, when we prove that there exists a covering, in some cases we'll need to use transfinite induction. In 2.2, you're just going to do induction on a well ordering. Um, but when we talk about covering theorems, we'll need transfinite induction. Okay, so this is just a very quick, and I apologize, very brief and uh, crass, just throwing these definitions at you. But when you do the homework, it should be enough. So you're just going to be able, you're just going to need to go through some very routine verification of definitions. Um, and I'll have this uploaded. You just reference the slides. You look at what an initial segment is, and it should it will follow directly from the definition that something's an initial segment. But I just need you to have that written down yourself so you see what he's talking about. Um, and the reason I have you do exercises with this is that Federer uses these arguments, and so the exercises I give you that have these set theoretic arguments are just walking you through what he's talking about. Okay, because sometimes it'll seem like oh you know where did that come from? Okay. So that's it. So that concludes the material for today. What you're going to read this week is going to be 2.1 of Federer. And I just want to talk about that for just a couple minutes, and then uh, we can talk about anything else you know, if you guys have questions. So you're going to talk about measures and measurable sets. We're going to introduce, if you've, you know, you're not supposed to know anything about measure theory, but we're going to introduce this idea of measurability uh, of a measure as a function that works on all sets. So you can input any set into a measure. And this might contrast with what with what you've seen in a book like Rudin, because Rudin defines a measure on a uh, sigma algebra. Okay, but now we're just going to define our measure on all sets. And another thing that will be different, we're going to be talking about outer measures, but anytime I, you see the word measure from this point on, that means outer measure. Okay, so we do not have that uh, strict additivity relation that equals Okay, so this is why it would be nice if you actually have not seen measure theory before. So you won't see like, well, wait, I thought a measure was this. Okay, this entire book we're working with outer measures. But he's going to call it a measure throughout this entire textbook. So 2.1, the first bit, you're going to be talking about numerical summations. Your first exercise is on numerical summations. Be very careful going through this. Um, just going to walk you through, you know, how do we, uh, you know, the first exercise is, saying that, you know, this idea of a numerical summation, it's unique. Okay, there's one way to take the summation, and you're going to prove that by inducting on uh, the size of the set you're summing over. Okay. You're going to define a measure. Very simple. Prove some basic facts about it. If you've taken measure theory, you've seen them before. But you'll prove some basic facts about it on the problem set. Uh, you'll talk about some very basic regularity stuff. So, because that... Uh, you know, at some point we're going to be needing to talk about radon measures, and those are measures that satisfy inner and outer regularity. Okay, but we need to cover this general idea of what a regularity is. We're going to talk about holes, um, some properties, some regularity properties, something very basic, and then at the end we have this kind of deep two-page discussion with set theory, talking about Boolean numbers, and the point of the exercises on the proof set is to walk you through what's happening. Okay. He's going to talk about accessible cardinals, and then at the end, so Tropy here, he was very nice, so Tropy uh, speaks German, and Federer references this paper that's only in German, and uh, Tropy was so nice, he translated the whole paper. There's no, there's no translation for it, this is a paper by Tars, Tariski, Tarski, and uh, so he translated the whole thing, I'm going to look over it and format it. 
uh, maybe. I, mean, I think I think it looks just great how it is. But uh, you'll all see because he's going to talk about the exclude. We can exclude some type of cardinal, and we can have the same theory. So uh, you know, be sure to thank Tropy for that because that's going to allow us to really understand what he's talking about. Because that's a big point here. He's going to say we can now after this section. From here on, every set has a cardinality that is an ULAM number. And he's going to use that in proofs. And you need to not feel like, oh, that's kind of suspicious. Why do you just get to do that? <laughs> you know? And he references this paper. But it's only available in German. But Tropy was so nice as to translate it for all of us. So I'll make that available. I'll put it on the website. Of course, credit Tropy for that and everything. So, uh, But that's all you have for this week. And so next Saturday... We're going to open up. We're going to discuss the homework. I'll show you the solutions. And uh, we'll talk about some geometric measure theory. Hausdorff measure. We'll take the Hausdorff measure of a couple fractals. We'll talk about Hausdorff dimension. Like, you know, you've heard the, what's the uh, perimeter of Great Brit Britain? How long is the coastline? Okay, this problem that has no, there's no set number of how long the coastline is. Uh, but we'll talk about fractals and stuff like that. And then we'll talk about the second homework, okay? But Wednesday, I would hope that you guys, you know, show up for the study session, help each other solve the problems. And also, we have these, you know, I would encourage you to do the additional exercises. There's just two additional ones. Um, the first one's going to be very basic. You're just going to point out which ones are measures or not. And then the second one is going to talk about the Lebesgue measure. And I would actually, if you, can, if you only have time for a few problems, I would really encourage you to do problem eight. Because I'm going to be talking about the Lebesgue measure next week because it interacts intimately with the Hausdorff measure. Okay, so I recommend you definitely hit exercise eight, hit exercise six, just do those two definitely, and then what else do you have time for, okay? Um, and before that, one more thing. We were talking about, before we started this, this idea of, you know, grading assignment. I don't know if any of you are interested in that, but if you want something where I would just have an Excel spreadsheet with your name, and then when you do the problem sets, you know, we can, you can see whether or not they're correct. You can grade it yourself. I can grade it for you and give you feedback if you want. And then I just put, you know, you got 100% or something like that. And uh, uh, we can, I don't know. So by the end of this, you <laughs> have some sort of score or something like that. So if you're interested in that, you know, certainly let me know. But if not, that's no problem. Um, do we have any questions before we wrap things up? I'll go ahead and stop the recording. So.